I'm going to start someplace kind of different this morning. Uh, as I was studying, I went into Exodus. Uh, Moses kept running through my head. And I couldn't figure out why because I thought, well, because this isn't this season about telling the Christmas story and talking about, you know, the whole thing of the Christmas story. And um, so I kind of wrestled with the Lord a little bit this morning on that because I thought, if I had start preaching on this, people might think, whoa, what is going on? But I want you to listen because the real, the reason that Jesus came is in the scriptures. It's in the Old and in the New Testament. And as we study it, we can see where long, long ago they were saying that Jesus is going to come. And the Lord's presence was on the earth. And um, Moses was exposed to that presence. And so I just want you to listen a little bit about Moses and about the people. And why, why did Jesus have to come? So many times we preach, oh, Jesus came, it's his birthday, and I've done it. But this morning, the why kept coming to my Why? Why was it so important? Why did he have to come? Why did he come the way he did? Why did he die the way he did? But God had a plan since the very beginning. So we're going to go to Exodus 33, verse 7 through 11. And it says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it, to, he called it the tent of meeting. That's what Moses called this tent. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. So Moses set up a tent. It was called the tent of meeting. Everyone who sought the Lord would go out to that tent. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all of the people would rise up. And each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and it would stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak with Moses. Moses went out to the tent of meeting and when he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would stand at the entrance and the Lord would speak with Moses. The Lord was speaking with Moses. I want you to keep that in your head. The Lord spoke to Moses, okay? When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. So Moses had this relationship with God. <clears throat> Moses. Not the people. The people had to rely on Moses for God's word, for God's direction, for what God wanted them to do. You see? So, you know, we always make fun of the Israelites in a way because I think, man, they were so stupid. But think about it. We're stupid, and we have the Holy Spirit. A lot of times we make bad decisions or we go the wrong way, and we have the Holy Spirit. These people did not have that. You have to remember, all they had was Moses going into the tent seeing the pillar of cloud, knowing that God was there, but there was no relationship for them with God. They praised and worshipped him because of Moses. So, this is the greatest part. We go to verse 12. It says, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you, in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation 
is your people. Moses was the intercessor for the people. He was reminding the Lord, these are your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, Moses said to God, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And, Mo and the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. The Lord was having this interaction with Moses, or Moses was having this interaction with the Lord. And the Lord says, I'm going to go with you. And he says, I'm not going to go without your presence, Lord. I'm not going anywhere without you. And so Moses was the leader of these people. But Moses was the only one that understood the presence of God. In the church today, we do not understand this powerful presence of God. There is a presence of God that we better be fearful and not going with it. When the presence of God comes over us, we need to be saying, Lord, I'm not going without you. I'm not going ahead of you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang right with you. And that's what Moses was saying. I'm not going without you. And so then in 18, it says, Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. <coughs> and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I shall show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. <coughs> and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and I will cover you. with my hand until I pass by and then I will take away my hand <coughs> and you shall see my back Verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, 
and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. This is a prophecy that Isaiah made about Jesus the Christ coming. Moses had had was in the presence of God. That did not work out so good because the Israelites had no presence of God. They did not understand the Spirit of God. And every time Moses went away, what happened? They were stiff-necked, weren't they, Fred? They were stiff-necked people. But they did not understand the presence of God. Um, and what I want to get at is we do not understand the gift, the great gift that Jesus was. Because all through the Old Testament, the Lord was trying to get to us. He was trying to show us who he was. <coughs> And so he used Moses, he used Abraham, he used Jeremiah, he used all the prophets. But still, the people did not have it for themselves. So Jesus was on his way. The Lord had made a plan. Because he looked at it and he says, this is not working too good. My people need to know who I am for themselves. So the prophecy was, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The people. Not just one person, the people. Jesus died for the people. He was for the people. And that's who he was after. It didn't work just coming through one man. So then I went into Matthew 4, 12 through 17. And it says, this is um, Jesus begins his ministry. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, and in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Do you see the old and the new coming together? Jesus came because the Lord said, I can almost see him saying, son, I'm going to have to send you down. This is not working. Just one man speaking to a people and trying to lead the people without your presence just is not working. So Jesus came on the scene, and he fulfilled this prophecy of Isaiah. It says, the land, <coughs> well, I'm going to go to 16. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, <coughs> on them a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus said, Here I come. It's been prophesied what had uh, with Moses. Moses, it just it just didn't work. So the Lord sent his son, prophesied by Isaiah, into Matthew, and then we go into Luke. We go into Luke 2, 67. salvation 
wouldn't it have been so exciting if this prophecy from Isaiah, these people knew about it, and the disciples were preaching on it, wouldn't it have been so exciting to be living in the days when that prophecy was coming true? Can you imagine when Jesus was born and you knew, say you were one of the ones that knew the prophecies of Isaiah, and you were starting to see it unfold. Do you understand what is what Revelation has been telling us? We are starting to see it unfold. We are living in those same kind of days. We are living in the days where we are reading prophecy, and the prophecies are starting to unfold. That's the very thing that was happening in the Christmas story. The prophecies were starting to unfold. Like we we're starting to see this was true. That Isaiah was true. That what he said was true. Jesus was coming. And Zechariah was um, affirming that in Luke. And he said, um, let's see, where was I? 69. And he's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet. So he's talking about his own son, John. You will be called prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. The tender mercy of our God. The Lord had such tender mercy on us. He cared so much for us that he sent his son to deliver us, to forgive us, and, and set us free, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. He is, that's old Zechariah there. He hadn't spoken since uh, John. He found out that he was going to have a son. Zechariah had not been allowed to speak. But once his son John was uh, born and he named him John, then he prophesied about who was coming. Now remember, John was the precursor. He was the forerunner. In the days we're living in, there are some forerunners. There are people preaching on Revelation about Jesus coming again. They're getting, they're warning us. They're telling us. You know, uh, the other day I heard a person was telling me that in their church there was a pastor preaching on Revelation and they told him they didn't want to hear that. Yeah, they don't want to hear that. Well, it, it makes them uncomfortable because this could happen. It is happening, but they don't want to know about it. And they don't want to know about the Old Testament because that's irrelevant. I'm going to tell you something. If you don't know what the Old Testament says, you're not going to be able to figure out the new because it all connects. As you see, we take the prophet from uh, the prophecy from Isaiah and we go into uh, Matthew and Luke. It all fits together. So when you have a church that says, we don't want that, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? God have mercy on their soul. Because that it is the truth of the gospel that we need in these days. Jesus' birth, yes, we stop and remember it today. But I'll tell you, I took, uh, when we were back for our prayer time, I told Bernie, I said, I feel so like weepy today. Like, I just feel like I could just weep. And I'm like, this, that's not really like me. I'm, this is a joyful time, and I have it's a wonderful time. But there's something about this time that I feel like things, and like I said, with trying to get this lesson together, it was just like one thing after another after another, and I just couldn't get it together until this morning. 
And at, when you go home, you might think, she still didn't have it together. <laughs> <coughs> but I feel like the Lord wants us to know that. So we're going to go into John 16, 4 through 15. And I want you to hear uh, about the work of the Holy Spirit. So we want to go back to Moses. Moses could go into the presence of the Lord. The people could not. Moses could speak with the Lord. The people could not. All they could do was take what Moses told them and follow what he said. That's why there was, there, well, and it's still that way today, actually, but uh, we don't have any excuse now. Um, so in John 16, 4, it says, But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these, this is Jesus talking. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now, this is Jesus talking to his disciples saying, I'm going to be going soon. I'm, I'm going to die soon. But I'm going to leave you something that will empower you to be able to follow me. But now, Jesus says, I'm going to him who sent me. He's going back to his father. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. <clears throat> Can you imagine walking with Jesus for three years? Feeling his love and his presence and his teaching, just like walking with him for three years. And he's saying, I'm going to be going. I'll tell you one thing, I, I bawl my eyes out. <coughs> That would be a terrible thing to think that he was leaving. What would we do? What would we do without him? Because he was God, and he could do anything. And he, But the love that people must have felt uh, from him must have been amazing. But he says, because I've said these things to you, sorrows filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Because, see, still, at that time, people, the, it was in the flesh. It was Jesus. It was Jesus that people had to be around. And Jesus knew they'd still be following him, just him. He could only be one place at a time. Jesus traveled around, but he could only be one place. So he said, I, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus said, if I don't go, the Holy Spirit can't come. Now, what did the Holy Spirit do? He gave each of us a way to communicate with our Lord. He gave each of us being able to walk into that tent of meeting when the presence of God was there and be able to speak and talk and have fellowship with our Lord. That's what he did. Jesus knew it had to be done. And there are so many today that, that want nothing to do with it. They don't want to hear about Revelation. They don't want to hear about the Old Testament. Well, how are they going to know when things start to happen of what's happening? You know, I'm not, I don't think I'm a prophet. Um, I'm just a, a preacher. But my job is to tell you these things are coming. That the prophecies of old have been fulfilled about Jesus. And the prophecies in Revelation 
are being fulfilled now. Now they are. That we cannot live in a bubble or with our head stuck in the sand forever. I hope not. I hope that we can see what is coming. When you see churches drying up, dying, because they have no Holy Spirit. I walked into a church last week, and I walked in, and I thought, whoa, no Holy Spirit here. Like, you could not. It was just, it was just like walking into any building. Because... It has become about the building. It's become about uh, the, the place. It's become about uh, the traditions of men that nullify the word of God. And the Holy Spirit has left the place. I feel more Holy Spirit here in this place than I feel in a lot of churches that I walk into. Isn't that sad? Because they do not want to know the truth. They do not want to hear it. It may make me up. Uh, it may make them have to do something. They may have to change. They may have to have the Lord be in charge instead of themselves. So I want to go back here to Acts 2.14, and then I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, this is when the Holy Spirit came. Well, we'll start at 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came down from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now I'm going to skip over here uh, because of time, and I want you to look at uh, verse 14. And Peter, Peter was standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them and said, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For because they, they said that the people were drunk because they had been talking in tongues and they had been um, talking in different languages and people could understand what they were saying uh, that were of those languages. But he said, it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through Joel, the prophet Joel. <coughs> In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, this is a prophecy for today. The men and women will prophesy that there will be the old men and the, uh, the young men will see visions and the old men are going to be dreaming dreams. The Lord is going to show us what is to come. Why do you think that is? So we do not fear. So we do not fear. What did the angel say to the shepherds? The first, first thing he said, do, fear not. Do not be afraid for what is coming. If you are watching any anything at all, is what is going on if you can find any truth in it know that the world is in turmoil know that it is it is upside down and all around <clears throat> someone sent me a video and i think it was you Bernie, maybe about this woman who addressed um a, a school um at the pta and they were allowing a um a man to dress as a woman and teach a class with these little children. So she came in dressed as a cat, okay? And she said, I am a cat. And she said, are you gonna say I'm a cat? And they were like, no. And she said, then why would you say that this man is a woman? Just because he dresses like a woman. I thought it was excellent. I mean, she went right at it. That, when in the days we're living, right is going to look wrong and wrong is going to look right. It's been prophesied. 
that's what's going to happen. Revelation will tell you what is coming. Yes, it is very hard to understand. But if you can think and get into a study where they, it, it, it shows you the, um, the word pictures and how with uh, John, how he uh, put it all together and in his mind what it must have looked like. We can start to understand Revelation. We are supposed to learn what Revelation says. So we will be ready for what is coming. I know that this is an odd message for a Christmas morning. And I, forgive me if I have offended you in any way. But God is with us and he is trying to show us what is coming. We do not know what is coming in the year ahead. And we must be ready. We must be ready with what is to come. And no, it's going to be no more church as usual. Sometimes I think that's what we do. We just put it in a circle and say, here guys, see how you do with this. And that's a small thing compared to the changes that are coming. <clears throat> we must understand. In Matthew 1, 23, it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. When Jesus came to earth as a baby, he came as God. And his purpose was to show us God in the flesh. And, and then to die a horrible <coughs> death so that we could have the Holy Spirit to teach us and show us and give us strength in the days ahead. To learn how to protect our children. To learn how to stand for what is right and true. To learn all those things and show us, yes, this is, what, this is what's going to happen. But stand strong. Do not be afraid. For God is with us, yes? God is with us. So in this Christmas season that has become very commercialized, that has become very not, I think... I, I, and I, you know what? I am guilty of it. I think Jesus thinks, what has happened? What has happened to it? And I've done a lot of thinking about that in these last few days. What has happened? And it's interesting. I was in a, in a store, and I was buying stuff for my little grandkids. I'll tell you, it's a trap. And um, the, uh, the little girl, said, I said, I came in here for four things. And I said, and I have like 12. She says, it happens all the time. I said, why, how does it happen? I said, why, how does it happen that way? She said, it's marketing. They know, they know just exactly. They know people, they study you. And I thought, she is so right. We are falling into a trap. I am falling into a trap. It brings me joy to give, but, is this season just a reason for me to go out and just buy whatever I want to buy? <coughs> it could be. Instead of taking the time to realize what it is that has happened this morning, that God with us was a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing. This Jesus coming to earth. There was no one like him before or after no one and he came and lived 33 years on this earth and only three did he minister isn't it amazing it only took him three years to change the world it took him three years some preachers preach for 45 years and never change a thing <laughs> friend like that one <clears throat> Jesus, it took him three years. And then his time was up. And he said, I'm going to go because the Lord wants each one of you to have the Holy Spirit, to be able to speak to me, to be able to hear me, to be able to go into the tent of meeting and be in my presence. You know, when Moses would go into that tent of meeting, he would come out and his face would shine so bright that he would have to put a veil across his face. Have you ever been in the presence of God where you come out of it and you feel like your face is shining? 
wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to be able to be in the presence of God and know that what he is speaking to you is full, totally truth and that it will change your life and the lives of all those around you. As a church, as a church, I saw a report that these big mega churches, that many of those that are in these big mega churches don't even believe there's a God. They just go for the the hoopla of it. You know, they just go for the, the, the fun of it. There's a lot of things that go on in these big churches. You know, you can go in and have coffee. I'm sorry we didn't have coffee this morning. <clears throat> and donuts, Kathy. We can have donuts. But Jesus wants us to just come to him. Come to him. He came to set us free. He was born into this world so that we can have life and life abundant. He is the light of the world. If you look in your Bibles, I would say this week, this would be your homework. Go into your Bibles and find the scriptures that talk about Jesus being the light. The light. Um, Matthew 5, 14 says, you are the light of the world. It says, let your light shine before others. Let your light so shine before others that they see Christ. Is your face shining for Christ? When people meet you, do they know Jesus just because they see you? Jesus is not a taskmaster. He doesn't make you. He does not make you follow him. He calls you to follow him. He calls you to make him your Lord and Savior. That's who he is. He chose to come to earth because of us. And he calls us to follow him. He calls us to get in his word to have strength for the journey because this is quite a journey would you say and and it's a lot of ups and downs and all arounds and I'm going to tell you something else this morning the enemy is after you and he is after your family that's another thing this church didn't want to hear about they didn't want to hear about Satan don't talk to me about him well I'm going to tell you if we don't talk about him he's still going to be <clears throat> and he wants to destroy you and your family and all those that you love because when we carry the presence of Christ in us when we carry it in us <clears throat> we are his enemy we are and he comes after you doesn't he darling he comes after you but the Lord will give us the strength to stand so as we go out today and we celebrate with our families and we have our probably another meal or two or how many more this week, remember to carry the light of Christ within you. Remember that that is what this season is about. And I myself, I get worn out, I get weary, and I do it to myself. i got to have... I, I, I made all this food. I'm going to just share this, and I hate to admit it. But I made all this food. And we didn't even eat half of it, did we, Wayne? Wayne's like, I don't know what. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't eat half. <clears throat> but I thought, why, why do I do this? Why do I do, why do, I do this? A meal train. Yeah, I got meal train food. Um, I'm just, I'm just trying to, and I'm learning it along with everybody else, that the reason is Christ. That is the reason. It's an old cliche, I know that. But the reason is Christ, and that's why we celebrate. And as new beginnings, as we go into this new year, on this next new adventure, who knows, who knows what will happen? In this new year but I do know one thing that God is with us yes yes God is with us Amen. <laughs>